Hey, what's up, everybody? Jimmy Smith, hoping everybody's staying safe. Everything's going well on the street for everybody. Um, I'm here for my pre-fight look at UFC 250, Nunes versus Spencer. Uh, had some internet issues this week. It's been storming like crazy here in South Florida. So um, that's why it's going to be a little bit later than a lot of my breakdowns have been recently. But it's the way it is. We're going to start at the bottom. Sean O'Malley versus Eddie Wineland. Look, uh, I just finished doing uh, tonight's Sirius XM show, me and RJ Clifford on MMA Tonight. And he said something like, Sean O'Malley with a, a promotional fight against Eddie Wineland. We know what this is, right? Eddie Wineland has a name. He's fought some great fighters, uh, especially in the WC, UFC. Uh, lost to Henan Barrow. He had his years. His best years are behind him. And what it is, is Sean O'Malley needs to take on a veteran name to build some credibility. He's 11-0, outstanding finisher, great hands, good boxing. But he hasn't taken on that veteran name that's going to do anything for him promotionally. Uh, Eddie Wineland is that guy. Now, Eddie Wineland, of course, 24 wins, 13 losses. He's fought some great names. He's a grizzled veteran. And I've said this many times before, but it's worth saying again. The worst thing to be in MMA is that guy who has a name and you can't defend it anymore. Because your name still has value. People still want to build a reputation off you. But you don't necessarily have the skills to keep up with that. You can't keep up with the young guns anymore. That's how I see this fight. It's a showcase for Sean O'Malley. Not that he can't lose, that Eddie can't win. It's we know when the UFC put this fight together what they were thinking. Which is Sean O'Malley needs a veteran guy who's a veteran guy in this weight class but isn't so dangerous that he's going to take a gigantic step back with a loss. Uh, I think Eddie Wineland pretty much fits that bill. I think it's a showcase for Sean O'Malley. I think he gets it done by knockout probably in the second round. He's facing a veteran which might make him a little bit more careful um, in the first five minutes or so. But I think he catches him in round number two. Sean O'Malley by knockout round two. That's my pick. Neil Magny taking on uh, Anthony Rocco Martin. This is a tough one because in his last few fights, Martin has been cautious. He's used his range well, um, countered quite a bit, hasn't really gone in for the kill as much. Um, Neil Magny, that's kind of how Neil Magny fights. He has moments where he's been a bit, where he can and be aggressive and he can be a finisher. We saw that against Hector Lombard. But when guys go at him, and guys really impose their will on him, that's where he tends to have trouble. Santiago Ponzinibbio did it on the feet. Hector Lombard did it on the feet before he ran out of gas. Um, Damian Maia did it on the ground. Uh, RDA did it on the ground. When you go through Neil Magny and take away his, his range, stay out of the clinch, and really put it on him, he has trouble coming back from fights like that. But I don't see Anthony Rocco Martin as having that kind of ability. I think he's going to wait a lot and try to counter. That's hard to do against somebody with a build like Neil Magny. He's rangy. He doesn't use his range that well, though. He tends to use it in the clinch more than, you know, pumping a lot of jabs and using the lead foot to keep guys at a distance. He doesn't do that a whole lot. So... I really see this being a, an outside kind of striking fight. Hopefully, Neil Magny can get in the clinch where he's really effective. But I think it's going to be a ticky-tack kind of fight where not a lot separates the minutes and the rounds. But I think Neil Magny, having taken on better talent and coming off a win against uh, uh, Li Jinglong, I think his confidence is going to be good. And his veteran ability to win little tiny battles and exchanges will win him rounds and will win him the fight. I think Neil Magny by decision. And one of the things I tell fighters stepping up to the UFC or Bellator, that next, you know, 1FC, they're, they, they, they're doing great on the regional level, and they step up to the big fight. You win minutes, you win rounds, you win fights. That's how you have to see it. The days when you were going to fly and triangle guys and they wouldn't see it coming and you could just blow guys away with your aggression, that's over at the regional level. When you get to the elite level, it's you got to win the little battles that end up winning you the big battle. And so Neil Magny is better at that kind of game than Anthony Rocco Martin. He's just more experienced. So I think that carries him. I'm going Neil Magny by decision. Corey Sandhagen, Aljamain Sterling. Oh, this is a tough one to call because I think this is fight of the night. I think this is the fight that – I think the winner of this is really in position to be the next challenger at 135, even more than – the Komen event, uh, Garbrandt versus the Sun which I'll get to in a minute, I think this is the real showcase for the next contender. Corey Sanhagen, what do you say about his striking other than it's next level? It's really great. He's a giant for this weight class, 5'11", incredibly rangy, a volume striker, throws a lot of punches, brings a lot of physical pressure. That's what really Rafael Sun couldn't deal with in their fight is 
Corey Sanhagen was always in his face, always throwing punches, always throwing versatility, and Sun Tzu could never find that counterpunching space. He could never find that moment where he get in and land the big shot. He couldn't do that against Corey Sanhagen. You know, he just owned it from start to finish, made him operate from a, a very small octagon, meaning he just had the edge. And when he committed to the takedown and got it, we saw that Corey Sanhagen is a great scrambler and was able to get out of bad positions and able to turn thing to, things to his advantage. A lot of guys with his build, tall and lanky and rangy, aren't good scramblers. And he is. Aljamain Sterling is a guy, early on in his career, through a lot of kicks that tended to wear him out. He's gotten more efficient with his more recent fights, he's always been explosive. He's always been athletic. He's always had a good takedown, good submission game. He hasn't always been able to f pace himself well. That's really, if that's an issue still for him, it's going to come out in this fight because Sanhagen makes you fight the entire time. He puts you under pressure the entire time. He makes you deal with his offense the entire time. Um, the rub here is can Aljamain Sterling take advantage of the fact that Corey Sanhagen while a great striker, does take a lot of risks with his hands. He almost has that Diaz style where he kind of can let his punches float a little bit. He'll come out and not bring it right back and kind of let his, his, his hands hang. And so if you're explosive and you get in at the right time, you can make a, a guy really pay for that, especially if he's, he's got long limbs. It's hard for him to bring his, his hand all the way back to his chin. Aljamain Sterling may have the explosiveness to make Corey Sanhagen pay for making technical mistakes. I'm really torn on this one, and I know this is kind of an emotional pick, but I'm going with Aljamain Sterling. I know I've talked to Aljamain Sterling a lot in the last few weeks because I've been doing this, this roundtable thing for SiriusXM, and he's been part of that, and I guess I, maybe that's making me a little bit more emotional. I like the guy a lot. And he's really been lobbying for a title shot. He feels disrespected. He feels left behind. He's been public about his problems with UFC and Dana White and all this stuff in that position. Every fight is win or go home. He knows in his heart of hearts, if he loses this fight, he's out of title contention for at least the time being, if not the rest of his career, and the UFC will shelf him as long as they can, and they'll give him the hardest fights they possibly can to get back there. So this is the best position he's going to be in. If he loses, he falls way down. I think cornered, and it's it's win or go home. That he's he. I, I think he knows that. He's going to put everything into this fight, and that'll give him the grit to survive a very tough fight and some very tough rounds. I'm By the barest of margins, I'm going with Aljamain Sterling in this one. But that's a tough one. Cody Garbrandt versus Rafael Sensao. We just talked to Rafael Sensao uh, for Sirius XM. We did an interview with him. And cutting weight, so, you know, <laughs> uh, obviously not in, in the best mood in the world, but but thank, thankfully he gave us the interview. But this is a counter-striker who, in his last fight against Corey Sanhagen, kind of got bullied a bit. And the issue with that fight was, as I said when I was breaking down Corey Sanhagen, he couldn't deal with the physical pressure. He had trouble kind of getting cornered and pushed around a bit and never seemed to get his counter-punching space. The problem is, I think Cody Garbrandt fights a similar fight where he brings a lot of pressure and is throwing heavy hands. And Rafael Sensao needs to really step in and close distance and land power punches when he gets the opportunity. That's how you beat Cody Garbrandt because he throws a little wide. He throws a little wild. Those things catch up with him, and a good counterpuncher can really make him pay. Cody Garbrandt has a ton of question marks in this one. This is a guy, when he beat uh, Dominic Cruz, it was a virtuoso performance. One of those you remember for a long time. Everybody, myself included, thought, man, this could be the next big deal at 135 pounds. He looked fantastic. Never let himself get lured into the kind of fight Cruz wanted. Knocked him down. Never followed him down. Never rushed it. Never did anything like that. Reset and went back to his game. And if he fights smart, which he hasn't done in a while, I think since that fight, he can win this. Um, if he goes in recklessly against a guy who's not the biggest punch in the world, but you know thrives on that, the, those counter-punching opportunities, he could pay, and he could pay early. The problem Cody Garbrandt has had is, in two TJ Dillashaw fights, we saw a guy who just didn't make very good in-fight decisions, didn't make the right adjustments, got dropped by the same hand that stunned him uh, a few seconds earlier in the second fight, TJ Dillashaw. It just He gets hit with a punch and, and plants his feet and wants to fire back and gets hit with the same punch again. He's got to fight smart. He's had a long time off. He's changed teams. He's changed coaches. Hopefully, there's a slightly f higher fight IQ from Cody Garbrandt because this fight is very loaded. And what I mean by that is Cody Garbrandt has way more to lose than Rafael Sensao. I think it's similar with the, the Sanhagen-Sterling fight. 
San Hagen doesn't want to lose, but he can afford a loss a lot more than Aldermaine Sterling. Similar deal, deal. Cody Garbrandt, if he loses four in a row after being champ, and three of those by brutal knockout, you know, let's assume it's another one against the Sunsau, you could be talking about people wanting him to retire. He should get out of the game, you know, four in a row, that's not good. From champ to boop, off a cliff. He could lose a lot losing this fight. A lot. He's really backed against the wall. Now. That makes him a dangerous animal. So hopefully we see a smarty Cody Garbrandt. If we do, I think he wins this one. Um, decision or knockout in the third? Because Rafael Sensau, he's a veteran, and Corey Sanhagen laid some good ones on him, and I never saw him physically kind of collapse. We didn't see that. So a uh, hard guy to knock out. It's either KO in the third or a decision for Cody Garbrandt. But we'll see which kind of Cody Garbrandt shows up. Amanda Nunez, Felicia Spencer. I wish I could make this breakdown more interesting. Uh, Felicia Spencer, big. She's a natural 145-pounder. Amanda Nunez, of course, goes from 35 to 45. So uh, Felicia Spencer might have a size advantage. She has excellent ground and pound. She has great top positioning. She has a good submission game. I don't think she gets a chance to use any of those things. Amanda Nunez just hits too hard at 145 pounds. We saw what she did to Cyborg. We saw what she did to J uh, Jermaine Duran to me. Uh, she's just a better puncher. And I don't think she respects the stand-up of Felicia Spencer enough to kind of wait and be a little more tactical like she was against Durandamy, like she was against Shevchenko. I think she goes at Felicia Spencer hard. I think she goes at her early. Um, Felicia Spencer had the chin to go three rounds of Cyborg. So I think even if she gets hurt pretty bad in the first few rounds, I think we see this go into the championship rounds. It's no knock on Felicia Spencer. I think she's running into the best uh, women's fighter of all time in Amanda Nunez. So the issue is not that Felicia Spencer, Felicia Spencer is a bad fighter. It's that I don't see anybody but Father Time catching up with Amanda Nunez. I don't see anyone in the field right now at 35 or 45 beating her. It's going to take a few years and a few fights to wear her down a little bit. Maybe her skills start eroding and somebody catches her in the middle. That's certainly a possibility. But Felicia Spencer, I think, is catching Amanda Nunez at the wrong time. I think it's Amanda Nunez by knockout, I would say, in round four. Felicia Spencer is going to try to make it interesting. But unless she can get on top and really work her size advantage in her ground and pound and work her submission game with her transitions and all that stuff, I see it as Amanda Nunez's fight. I think this is on the feet a lot. And I think Amanda Nunez make, makes her pay. Manny Nunez by fourth round knockout. And I'll be back after UFC 250 to own all of my picks. Appreciate you all for watching.